the webinar, I believe it's 36th webinar in series of healthcare innovation research in, in startup in Pakistan. My name is Danish Bhatti. Uh, I'm a movement disorders neurologist, associate professor at University of Nebraska Medical Center. I'm the chair for Apna Merit for 2021. Uh, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all again. Uh, these have been wonderful uh, sessions, uh, a lot of uh, things learned from us. And as many of you know, that uh, these uh, are uh, AMA category one approved CME uh, credit hour sessions. Uh, credits are issued every quarter. So we've already issued uh, credits for the first two quarters, uh, the first uh, 24 webinars. And then after the next 12, uh, we will be issuing, which I believe after this session, we'll be issuing the CME credits for, for the next set of webinars. So you will uh, receive uh, an email on, uh, on how to go about that. I also want to thank the uh, RISA committee of APNA, Research, Education and Scientific Affairs Committee, who very kindly uh, covered the cost of uh, CME uh, uh, for these sessions. And that's why we are able to offer it for free. Uh, uh, we uh, try to disclose all the conflicts and if you see anything, please do let us know. Uh, but we have invited many uh, people with um, commercial interest, industry, industrial interest, interest just for educational purposes. We are not, uh, promoting or supporting any one particular entity uh, in this uh, CMA category, and we'll try to dis disclose any relationship a speaker or a panelist has uh, commercially uh, for these activities. Um, as, um, as you know, the drill by now that we'll start uh, with the introduction and a, a talk by our speaker for today, uh, and then we will open for some panel discussions. Uh, many of our uh, committee chairs in Merit uh, often join and they can ask their questions and then uh, all of you can ask your questions. You can uh, preferably ask questions in the Q&A box. Uh, we'll try to look at the chat box, but uh, we may miss a question there. And then if you would like to uh, speak your question and if we have time, we'll be happy to give you the microphone, raise your hand. Uh, if you like microphone to introduce yourself and uh, to, to make your comment or ask a question. And towards the end, we'll be happy to take those comments um, uh, given if we have some, some time left, which you know, hopefully we, we will. Um, so uh, with that background, oh, and then last comment will be that please introduce yourself in the chat box. Remember, we have our um, conference coming up, which is the culmination of all these research webinars. All these speakers who were part of these 36 webinars have been invited uh, to come and present in Apna Merit Conference that will be on December 22nd. At Raulpindi Medical University, all of you are more than welcome to join and attend and hopefully get to meet each other, get to in person uh, instead of uh, on a screen, on a computer screen. So um, uh, we will uh, we welcome you all to uh, in, put your introductions in the chat box uh, and, uh, and put your questions in the Q&A box. With that, let me go to the topic for today. It is my great pleasure to invite um, uh, our speaker for today to talk about applications of artificial intelligence in hematopathology uh, as a case study for AI in healthcare. And he'll be talking about the challenges and practical aspects of uh, such an a, such a implementation. So it's a wonderful topic, as you know, that uh, AI in healthcare is becoming a big focus in general and also in Apna Merit. Um, our, uh, uh, we, we have formed a new committee on AI uh, in Merit and Professor Sabat Hussain is uh, enthusiastically leading that committee with great passion. And I'm glad to have him today uh, on the panel um, for, for his attendance. Uh, and uh, our speaker today uh, is Dr. Hassan Sajid, um, a PhD um, and head of robotics and AI department at NAST uh, in Pakistan. Uh, and it's a great pleasure because Dr. Sajid is one of those uh, leading uh, experts in AI and healthcare in Pakistan uh, and a hidden gem that not many people know about uh, for all the wonderful work that he's doing. And, he, and uh, it's, it's my pleasure and, and honor to have him come and, and talk to us and, and connect with us. So Dr. Sajid um, has received his BS degree in, me in mechatronics engineering from National University of Science and Technology in Islamabad in 2007. And then he did his MS and PhD degrees in electrical engineering from University of Kentucky in USA in 2014 and 2016. And he's currently running the robotics and AI department in NAST and is the scientific director for National Center uh, for Artificial Intelligence, uh, which is the consortium of multiple labs in Pakistan doing work in AI. And he's the director of AI at uh, C-Paradigm Diagnostics 
USA, a uh, US-based um, company working on AI in hematopathology. Um, he has expertise in the areas of computer vision, machine learning, and deep learning. Uh, his research interests include speech and text recognition, video analytics, and application of AI in healthcare, crowd and traffic domains. He has more than 20 high impact peer reviewed publications, and he has won fundings for more than 100 million uh, for various projects that he has been doing. And he is a recipient of the US State Department Fulbright Scholarship, which is a very, very prestigious award uh, with a global competition and very difficult to win. Uh, and is even within US has a huge prestige. If you're a Fulbright scholar, uh, you know, you're welcome uh, any place uh, um, uh, where you would want, want to visit. So it's uh, my great pleasure to have Dr. Hassan Sajid uh, present on the topic of AI and healthcare. Dr. Sajid, over to you. So thank you very much and Asalaamu Alaikum everyone. Uh, good e evening and good morning. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, let me share my screen and I think we can formally uh, start with the presentation. And I would like to Ex express my pleasure uh, for the invitation for today's talk. Uh, I hope the slides are visible just to double yes. check. All right. All right. So, uh, myself, Dr. Hassan Sajid, this is today's uh, presentation agenda. I'll quickly and briefly tell about myself. Uh, then, today I'll Today's presentation will be a bit different for many of the people because I come from a, a very different background and uh, essentially from a lens of an AI practitioner who is trying to implement different things in the healthcare domain. So um, listening to an AI practitioner, practitioner would help to gauge the different type of things that as an AI expert, we are looking to extract out from the medical communi community to implement uh, practical projects and to make sure that the healthcare or the AI or the medical community understands what are the challenges that the other side is facing. So I think, um, you know, th there's a lot of gap that has to be fulfilled between the two areas that are the med medical experts and the AI practitioners. So I will be touching upon those expect ex uh, you know, aspects by going through two case studies. Um, so before that, I will uh, quickly give a very uh, you know, 10 to 13 minutes background of theoretical and practical AI. Maybe most of you might have heard about the theoretical part, but practical is quite different. Um, then I will, you know, execute that on the morphology, one of the applications that we have already built. And if time permits, we'll go towards uh, fish. Morphology is basically a very fundamental uh, test that is, you know, initial screening at a tissue level for, for further testing, whereas FISH is a cytogenetics test that is done uh, at the level of a nucleus um, to help um, detect different type of genetic abnormalities. And then I'll just uh, talk about the lessons learned and the future directions. So I'll begin with the introduction background. Uh, so head of robotics and AI department at NAST. I am also a scientific director at National Center for AI. Um, currently I'm director of AI and working with Paradigm, which is a hem hematology lab in US. Uh, it's the fifth largest at this point, uh, and we are the AI wing for that part. Uh, I have more than 20 plus years of experience, both in academia and industry. I've spent more time in industry. I'm a full bite alumni, and I have uh, raised more than 15 million USD in grants and funds for search projects, as well as some commercial ventures. So this is a very quick and brief about myself. So let's dive into the theoretical AI. Um, so these are three buzzwords that you might have heard, AI, machine learning, and deep learning. Uh, just to give a clarity, AI has been since 1950s um, with checkerboards as, you know, one of the com common games that people used to play. Then machine learning, you know, spam, not spam, you have already heard, and then deep learning. But remember, the, the machine learning is a sub-branch of AI, and then deep learning is a sub-branch of machine learning. So there's nothing new, it's only that the depth is increasing, and with deep learning coming in uh, after 2010 in the recent decade, uh, it has started to actually make uh, impact and it can so add value and solve different type of problems. Uh, so this is why there's a lot of boom and it can actually add value. Moving on, this is a, you know, uh, just a quick bit because it's dominantly machine learning is used nowadays. Uh, so it gives, this machine learning gives the computer ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So you do not need to tell the computer that how do you diagnose or do something. On the left, the traditional approaches that is being followed you have the data and you know the rule set or you, you do have the logic. Um, once you have these two components, you can get the answer. For example, 
let's assume that um, there is a data that is an image and you want to diagnose whether it is a cancer or not. Now, writing the rule set of such a problem is very complex. Um, so that's where we go towards machine learning. And in machine learning, you have the data and the answer on the label. And then you try to model or learn what a human is thinking. So your data will be an image here and your label might be cancer or not cancer. And then the machine will sit down, there will be some algorithms running in and it will try to understand what a, you know, uh, a, a physician would think about. Uh, so it's more of a, like a small tiny brain to understand on a very high level. Whereas if the rules are very, very simple, then you can go towards the traditional programming, otherwise it does not work that well. All right, so quickly machine learning, there are two types, supervised and unsupervised. In supervised, you have data and the labels. Um, and in unsupervised, you do not have the labels. For example, if you have images, you have the labels such as cancer, not cancer, then you are actually supervising like you are teaching a kid. But if it is unsupervised, then you do not have any type of labels and it has its own use cases. So generally, you know, when you engage with AI practitioners, you should know some of the nomenclature. So there are different type of algorithms that fall under, under these two categories, a regression, uh, classification, ranking, anomaly, clustering, and recommender. So I'll give you a few examples. Regression is where you predict, you know, a numerical value. For example, you want to assess the risk if you, we can grade it from one to 10, that what is the risk of this patient being uh, cancerous? And you can give it eight, nine, zero, one, two. So it's a, it's a continuous, you know, uh, number. Now, so classification, uh, is it a cancer or is it not a cancer? Is it a mild cancer? Is it a moderate or a severe category? So these are, you know, very clear categories where the classification comes in. Uh, ranking is uh, all of us use Google. We try to search different type of topics and the most relevant topic pops up on the first page at the top. So this is how, you know, the most relevant thing is at the top to the most least. So this is what ranking is. Anomaly is of course things that are out of uh, you know the common behavior clustering for example we can cluster uh, different type of population based on their genetic similarities so this is one of the examples of clustering where you look at uh, the similar thing things uh, based on some criteria and pull them into one cluster recommender systems we all shop online and uh, based on our history it recommends the relevant products or or, or, or things that might be of our own interest if we talk about healthcare or medical, imagine that if we can have a recommended system, which can tell the course of action or therapy, what would be the next step? What would be the better next step that we can do to such a, uh, a patient? So these are you know the algorithms that are very, very important. Just to quickly go through the supervised learning workflow, um, on the bottom, you have a, you know, a, very, a toy example of a training data along with its label. We have multiple images of apple, pear, and so on. And on the right, you have some test data. So generally what happens is that you have the training data set that has data and the labels. You have the learning algorithm. There are some iterations in which it starts to learn whether this, in this image, it's an apple or a cow and so on. And then we have the model once there is certain level of accuracy that we achieve. We test that on our you know, unseen or blind data so that we make sure that once we roll it out for real world applications, it stays at that accuracy. So this is a very you know, high level. So you have a training data set, you, there's a learning algorithm that learns based on the labels that you have provided. If there's a reasonable accuracy, you test your model to verify on a test data set and then you push it out uh, in the real world. So this is, uh, and by the way, supervised is one of the most dominant uh, algorithms that is used in uh, real world. So I think many of you my, who have tried to, you know, search these things, they might, I might have already heard these topics, um, but practical AI is very, very different. Um, so this image, um, so whatever we have discussed in the previous slides and, and, and that which exists in the theory, that only constitutes this block, this small block. Now in this slide, we have uh, different type of boxes. Each box has a different size. Remember the size dictates the role of that part, the, the role of that thing in the AI project. So as you can see, the data is the biggest, 
one. So data has the most importance. Then the software, problem definition, hardware analysis, domain knowledge, and so on. So problem definition and business process. Um, if we design the, if we do not understand the clinical workflow, uh, we cannot design a, an application that can fit into the workflow seamlessly. If it does not fit seamlessly, there's a lot of resistance. So this is one of the key things. Problem definition is very, very important. Do you want to predict whether it is a cancer or not cancer? This is a binary problem. But if you want to assess the risk, then you go back to zero. So the question that needs to be answered is very, very important. Hardware analysis is very, very important because that is the source of the data from which uh, you get all type of data. If the data is not high quality, then AI is not going to work. Domain knowledge transfer, whatever the pathologist or radiologist or the physician thinks, the practitioners, AI practitioners have to somehow understand, um, you know, that knowledge. Otherwise, he cannot create the mind of a radiologist or a physician. Um, then data itself is very, very important. Important. It has multiple steps, as I will apply on the uh, morphology case. Annotation software, it's a software that helps the you know, physicians to mark whether this is a cancer, not cancer, what type of cell it is, and, and not. So there are different types of protocols that needs to be embedded based on our experience. Uh, otherwise, the annotated data is uh, cannot be consumed by AI models. And we go back to the zero point. Um, human in the loop is very, very important. Remember that AI is an assistive system. It augments the capability rather than uh, replacement. So, so it so human works together. The software is designed in a way that human can interact. Uh, then, of course, there are other uh, regulatory matters where you integrate uh, on for the uh, different regulations. Model versioning is very very important because AI incrementally you know increases its performance. So imagine that uh, you have trained a model on certain type of patients, but new type of disease comes in, and then you you are using the same model. Uh, in this way, you know, you need to incorporate that part as well. So it's very important. Uh, uh, likewise, monitoring, we have to continuously monitor these type of models. So I hope that this slide gives you a perspective of uh, the different parts or, or, or angles that come into the AI project. It's not only the models that are important, but as a whole, we have to work on all the parts to make, make it successful. So generally, the key question is when do you want to apply AI or machine learning? So if the problem is, um, we can look at that from two perspectives. One is the problem perspective, what type of problem are we trying to solve? And the data, because data is the key ingredient for AI problems. Whether it handles um, the problem, handles complex logic, you know, whatever the pathologist or physician is thinking about something, there's a lot going on in the head. You cannot write that on a piece of paper. Uh, it scales up fast. It requires specialized personalization. By that we mean, uh, if you are, uh, you know, for example, we are moving towards precision medicine. So for for each patient, you need to have a very personalized uh, sort of, you know, um, uh, front end. So it adapts in real time. So there are things that are changing. So we need to adapt in real time. From the data perspective, uh, we have to be in ethical and moral bounds. It is available, accessible, secure, private. The data is relevant, it's unbiased and continuous. By continuous, we mean that new data is coming in. Whereas we do not want to apply machine learning or AI just because it's a fancy thing. If it, it can be solved by simple rule or logic, there's no need. If uh, it does not adapt to new, new data, then there's no need for that. Uh, remember that, uh, you know, like a human mind, it is, uh, uh, ML is an approximate solution. It can never guarantee you 100%. So in that case, you never go for AI. Uh, if the requirement is, is for full interpretability, then uh, we cannot go for machine learning or AI. So that's why human in the loop is very, very critical. If there is any of the concerns with the data in terms of its unavailability, privacy, it's irrelevant, biased, then we do not apply machine learning. All right, so before we, um, so there are five different level levels of AI solutions that exist. On the left side of the spectrum, it's totally manual and dependent on the human, that is the level one. And on the right, it's more and more, less and less human and more and more automation. So full automation, that is the level five, there's new, no human involvement and AI takes all the decisions. Whereas on the left side of the spectrum, it's human only and there's no AI involved. 
Now, before diving into level two, three, and four, let me show you an application and I will explain uh, in simple terms. So this is one of the applications that we have already built uh, for the fish cytogenetic test. So now these are, uh, you know, nucleus in which there are different types of signals, uh, which we are looking at inside the uh, nucleus. And the goal is to actually count these signals. Once we have the counts based on the distribution, we are going to do an interpretation. Now on the bottom here, where my cursor is, you can see that there's the pattern. If human or the, you know, technician or the supervisor has to do it uh, on his own, which, so then it means that it's, manual, but there is an AI that is learning in the background in a shadow mode. Now, the second option could be that there is the AI sort of, you know, puts here some side type of signal counting, but human has to, you know, check it. So this is uh, a system mode that it is trying to tell that this is the signal, but human has to review it. We call this as level three, it is assistive. And imagine that there are hundred cells on 80 cells, AI is very, very accurate. And on 20 cell, it is not confident. So it brings up those 20 cells in front of the human only that, okay, I'm confident about the 80, but can you review these 20 only? So now this is what we call as partial automation or level four. So there is a very distinct or fine line between how you, um, you know, define these things. So, so shadow mode, you know, there will be no signal. It will be, you know, working in a shadow mode behind the scenes and learning uh, by looking at how human is behaving. Uh, so there, essentially there's no value addition. It's only gearing up to get, uh, to graduate to level three. Now AI assistance, there were hundred cells. It will try to predict for all the hundred cells, but it's the responsibility of the human to look at all the hundred cells. When it graduates to the next level, the software would, you know, for example, it's confident on 80, then a human has to only look at the 20 cells or even in some of the cases only. Uh, generally, all of, all of the AI projects start from level two and they go to level four. Now, why this is important? Because as the medical community should not expect in generally that something is going to work out of the box. And generally this is what happens. So there is a strong collaboration required to move from level two to level four, where the, the medical community or the physicians or the technicians need to be on board from level two, where they start to use the software in a certain framework and the AI can evolve over time to level four. So, so this is very, very important. So moving on, uh, one of the points that I would like to make uh, is the typical AI project workflow. So AI projects, there's a big gap between the proof of concept and the commercial deployment. Remember that we can do the proof of concept within, within one to three months, we, we can have a limited data set. We can see that whether AI is the solution for this problem or not. If it's not the solution, we will stop the project. Otherwise we move on. And then we have certain steps that are very, very important. If the problem formulation is not done in the correct way, uh, the project will suffer. And, and in a literal sense, we have to go back to step zero. So business and system analysis, where we understand what problem we are trying to solve, what are the data sources, domain knowledge, then data is very critical. Uh, does the annotation tool exist? Annotation tool is at the heart of any AI project. And uh, with that, we generate quality data. Once we have, uh, if we do have the tool, we move on and we deploy this tool and ask the physicians or the uh, technicians to start using that so that it can start to generate annotated data. And AI in the background starts to learn in the shadow mode. And the models start to fetch data from the annotations. And what happens is that it starts to learn more and more until it graduates to a partial automation. And then we deploy that on the application. So this is the general workflow, but you can see that this is one of the critical parts. And then this is an iterative part from level two to level four. And then we graduate to actual commercial deployment. So there is a time that is required on all the steps. So now I think let's, um, apply these concepts on the first case that is morphology. Um, so this picture shows the overall scope of the project. So the goal of the project is to come up with an AI algorithm that resides in the cloud where globally anyone from any type of capturing source, for example, there are different types of scanners. Uh, you know, you have bone marrow or peripheral blood slides that you put in these scanners or analyzers or microscopes. 
and they generate whole slide images or microscopic images that can be fed into the AI cloud where it can detect different type of cells, which can be further used for different type of purposes. For example, for automated triage for 100 cell differential um, for uh, CTC um, and so on, cell counting. Now, this is a very, very core algorithm and one of the core requirements where AI can read different type of slides automatically and not engage any type of technician so that it can be fed into the other parts of the of the chain to make decisions now let me show you the algorithm so let's take uh, so this is a snapshot of one of the whole slide images you can see and this is the tail part so the first step that we need to do because this we need to select very good patches or viable patches from this uh, you know um, whole slide image and this is very very big so we need to have multiple so the first algorithm, what it does is that it selects different type of patches, which are good patches. So, and how it is done, that the AI starts to observe the different type of uh, technicians, you know, working under the microscope. What are the parts of the whole slide images they pay attention to? What are the parts they ignore? So over time, it learns what are the viable patches I need to extract out. And once you have the viable patches, then it starts to look at the cells that needs to be uh, detected. So then, you know, for each patch, we have a cell detector that can detect different type of cells, and then we can have all the cells and further different type of analysis as per the need can be done for different type of purposes. So this is the basic algorithm. It seems very simple, but there are a lot of challenges which come through when we move from the whole side image till the cell detection. Um, we are uh, covering more than 50 type of cells. This is just uh, a listing of some of the RBCs, uh, right, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets that we are covering. Um, so let me show you some of the challenges and issues that we faced while we worked with the, um, you know, uh, uh, lab. So data quality uh, is the biggest problem. I will show you some of the examples. Uh, substandard staining and smearing. This is a problem that needs to be uh, catered for variations both stain and optical uh, by stain different type of stains are used of course and even with a single stain there are different type of uh, things that come up and optical of course different type of scanners uh, and optical optics that are involved in, in hardware devices data distribution is very very important one type of cells are much more than the other so there's higher accuracy on the cells that we have more data on and then lower accuracy on the cells that we have less data Medical concordance, even technicians, physicians, uh, you know, there is some sort of uh, medical discordance uh, many a times among pathologists, as well as there are wrong annotations, uh, which result due to this uh, medical discordance. So let me show you some of the examples that we faced when we started this project. So you can see uh, some of the sample slides that we uh, gathered from different type of lab, labs when we started the project and we had to go through this problem. So this is a bone marrow slide. Uh, you can see the staining issue, staining and smearing issue. Um, then another, uh, this is a peripheral blood slide. You can see different type of smearing, staining issues. Um, again, peripheral blood staining and smearing. So there's so much variety that until we have some standardization, the models cannot work. Remember, AI can work under certain conditions. If those are violated, then it would not work. Um, uh, so problem one was data quality. Number two is the stain variation. Let me show you some of the example variations. Some of them are from our own lab and some are from the other lab that we have worked on. Uh, you can see that it's the right stain, but you can see the variations. Now, if the AI model is trained on this type of variation, uh, whenever you will have this image coming in or this or any other, it will collapse. So, so we have to counter for such type of problems, either through ensuring data quality and consistency or coming up with some AI intervention that can also cater for such cases. So this was problem number two. <clears throat> Let me tell you about the uh, third problem that is skewed data uh, and cell distribution. You can see this is just a histogram or the frequency of the white blood cells that we had. And you can see that it is clearly dominated by neutrophil segmented. And then all the following are getting, you know, less and less and less. Um, this is a histogram of uh, red blood cells. You can see teardrops being dominant at a scale of 8,000 and remaining. So, so this is the distribution you can see. Uh, and platelets are touching more than 400,000. 
So you can see there's a clear, uh, you know, skewness or unequal distribution of the cells in platelets, red blood cells, and white blood cells, which makes the data biased uh, once you train the AI models. So, so, so this is what we have to be aware of that we, UK, we cannot wait that the AI models have to be deployed once we get the cells or something. Um, problem number four, wrong annotations. We went through this exercise for about three months. And once we did the QA, we found out that there were many wrong annotations uh, because the AI model was giving wrong predictions. We investigated that and we went back to the zero starting point. Uh, so you can see these some of the examples where these were experts, actually physicians, as well as a group of technicians uh, who look at the slides and they did wrong annotations, maybe due to poor quality and so on. So I'm just, you know, showing some of the, so this is the cell image. This is the wrong annotation. This is, this is what the, they labeled. And this is the actual annotation that we uh, found out later on. So now once you have a wrong annotated data, then AI cannot do anything. So we, and of course we need to make sure that there's consistency in the data, otherwise it will collapse. So I have shown you some glimpses of the issues and challenges that we face when we are sort of crafting such a system. Uh, data quality variations in both stain and optical data distribution, medical concordance, and what it, it can do. So we came up, so what we did is that we, we changed the whole uh, you know, process, how we worked with the physicians and the technicians. What we did is we came up with a specialized annotation tool that made sure that we resolved the data quality, medical concordance, and to some extent, the data distribution issues um, by using a blind and multi-tier, uh, you know, designing a blind and a multi-tier software and which we implemented uh, and let me go through the process, how we made sure that data quality is right and uh, how we make sure that uh, the discordance is minimal. So this, so let's take an example of a single whole slide image here. So first of all, this whole slide image comes in if it is poorly stained or smeared. Or, so let me explain these. Uh, so we have multiple tiers. So tier one, we have the lowest, like the technicians, and then tier two are the physicians, sorry, tier two are the uh, supervisors, and tier three, are, which is not shown, but the same logic applies to them, are the experts or physicians or the pathologist. So at tier one, they look at the slide. If that slide is uh, poorly stained or poorly uh, smeared, they will assign it a label, and they will not let it go through the remaining process. So there is a, you know, and they write the reason that what is the reason that uh, this is, there's a problem. So internally, the quality can be ensured later on. If there's a discordance between uh, multiple and all of these um, technicians are reviewing these slides in a blind manner, so they cannot collaborate in, in a way to let, um, you know, data pass. If there's discordance, then it is escalated to the next tier. And if there's further discordance, it is further escalated. Invalid slides are not gone through, then valid slides are pushed to the next stage where you have to select the viable patches. The same process follows at the patches stage that you need to select the relevant patches which uh, have the cells that can be used at the later stage. So the same process follows all the discordant results are pushed to the next layer. If they are not useful, they are uh, deleted and the remaining patches are pushed forward. Now you have everything at the cell level. And now at cell level, the same process follows uh, until uh, you have uh, you know, no discordance and then you pass on the clean and annotated data. So there are two things that we did. Through this process, we ensured that there's no there's minimal discordance. Number two, data quality, highest quality data. And number three, what it did is that it helped us to note that what type of slides and quality is being produced so that we can improve the wet lab process. Um, so this is the framework that we implemented and then rolled out the annotation tool. Remember the annotation tool part that I showed you in the whole project. And we deployed this uh, in, a, uh, sh in a shadow mode and graduated it to partial automation. And I'm showing you some of the results that AI achieved after that. So just to go through the uh, indications, the green are the correct predictions, so you can see so on the left, you have the AI predictions for each cells. 
and these are these are all coming from after you know letting the good quality slides coming in and then patches selection and then the cells and on the right these are the annotations that were done by the technician or supervisor and the physician so you can see that there are some false so red r represents the wrong prediction blue are the correct one missed out by blue missed out means that the cells that were missed out by the manual annotators uh, green are the correct predictions uh, you can see on the right that during the manual annotation the uh, person missed out the annotation even then ai knows that what type of cell it is and it predicts uh, that cell um, these are a few other examples you can see even for the platelets like they are small or big uh so in a few more examples you can see these are platelets and then neutrophil you can see that this is not marked so it can pick up all type of cells that were not even marked uh, and it works in an interactive way so whenever the results come in uh, for the cells that it is not confident the, the person can review it so i will move on um, Okay, so we talked about the data quality as well as the medical concordance uh, and to some extent about the data distribution because we um, deployed the models in um, shadow mode and later it graduated to a partial automation. Uh, variations, so variation is um, global, a global problem, it's there. Uh, and we worked out in, uh, you know, a state of the art, um, uh, you know, algorithm that we are, you know, right now in the IP process, uh, it's stay normalization. Let me show you an example how or how it works. So on the left, you have an image from one lab, from lab A and on the right, and the stains are actually the same. You have an image from lab B. So we introduced or developed a stain normalization algorithm. So now let's look at this image. This is the original image of lab B we what in the, on the right image in the right image what we did is that we extracted the stain of lab a and implemented and imposed that on lab b image so on this image we performed or moved the stain of the other lab and this is the result on the right okay now similarly this is the original image from lab a we extract the stain from lab b and impose that stain on this and the result is this image so what is the advantage of that let me show you through some of the results so on the left you can see the original image from lab b and this is actually a neutrophil segmented whereas it was misclassifying during the due to the poor stain it has a monocyte now by only applying the stain normalization it has started to correct the cells so you can see on the top misclassified as monocyte now it has only by applying the stain normalization similarly monocyte and then neutrophil band uh, so these are some of the examples here when it was poorly stained you can see it, it has totally missed out this cell whereas once you fix the stain you see it has started to detect those all of those cells so these are just some of the examples where it is missing out or where it has corrected uh, these type of cells by the way, uh, why this concept is very, very important is the same thing happens if you move towards the other tests, which are for fish or in cytogenetics, you move towards karyotyping where you have chromosomes and those are the other things that, that come in. So by, by, by these algorithms, we can go on a global scale where it can capture all the variations and, and normalize the stains in that sense. So this is the sort of the morphology project where we came up with some novel annotation process, which we enforced so it's more towards like a practical side and then an IP that we have generated uh, with this project. And, and we are using it for further processing. Um, case study number two, um, let me talk quickly uh, about the fish projects that is a cytogenetics project. The goal of the project was to design a low cost fish solution. So let me quickly tell you about um, this. So in the market, there do exist scanners that can automatically uh, perform the analysis, but remember they are quite costly. So BioView is one of the, uh, it ranges from anywhere from half a million to um, 750K. And then uh, GSL120 is another scanner that is around 227K. Um, but besides that, their turnaround time is very, very big. 
manually the process that follows for analysis is you just sit uh, you know under the microscope you look at the different patterns and then on average it takes about 45 minutes so what we did is that we designed a low cost fish solution where you just need a color camera you put that on your existing microscope and it can you know in in, in a cost of just 5 to 10k whereas the turnaround time is just 26 minutes so let me show you in a more detail, uh, detail. so if we <clears throat> talk about the manual process a physician technician or a supervisor looks uh, at the slide under the microscope he has a manual counter uh, in, in different forms and he looks at 200 different test cells uh, starts to punch in the numbers uh, on the manual counter once he is done with the 200 cells he opens up <clears throat> he captures one only one representative image and then opens up the lab information system punches in the signal counts which were on the manual counter and one image representative image into the lis to generate the report now manual counting is prone to error because a technician sitting on the microscope obviously is human uh, element is there and then you do not have any forensics or consistency uh, whereas what we did is that we came up with a semi-automated method where you do not need to buy any type of expensive hardware. You just put one camera on top of it. Uh, technician comes here and he can, he can just click buttons where he can capture different type of images. Once he starts to capture the images, this is a AI powered application that we have developed for fish. It pulls in all the images on the fly and it starts to analyze them directly. Remember that all these expensive scanners form a Z-stacked images that is capturing of images at different focal lengths. So what we did is that we, we, we can create the Z-stacked images. Uh, all the images are saved for later on analysis and it is faster and more accurate than manual. Uh, no need for expensive scanners. This is currently under validation. Uh, we, are, uh, we have already deployed our, this application. Uh, but, uh, you know, automating the process has helped us to meet uh, a lot of requirements in terms of turnaround time and save cost. Um, and this is the underlying uh, behind uh, this application. This is the underlying algorithm. You have the color Z stacked images. First of all, we segment out all the nucleus that are um, in the image. Uh, then we segregate informative versus uninformative cells. And the difference between informative and uninformative is that, for example, this is a clumped cells. So you can segregate, cannot segregate. So it, the AI notices even subtle variations and only passes the clean cells. And once you have the nucleus, then inside the nucleus, it looks at the signals and starts to count, for example, to orange, to green. And then it forms an enhanced nuclei, which is pleasing to the eye and can help us to quickly uh, count the cells uh, while the uh, technician supervisor or a physician is reviewing the count. Uh, then um, automatically remember the interpretation is generated. And finally, now the uh, supervisor or the physician reviews the, the interpretation and signs off. Um, this is the web application, just a snapshot of what uh, where you can define in our cells, uh, you can define panels, results, and, and those things. Um, so while we were developing this algorithm, uh, likewise, we had different type of challenges and issues, probe quality issues, um, sample quality issues, capture quality issues, all of them are filtered in the same way or the same framework that we developed for morphology. So I will show you some of the examples. These are some of the probe quality issues. If you have low quality probes, then of course there are issues where you cannot uh, count the signals or, or even look at them. So this is an example of dim and weak signals, indistinguishable fusion between the signals. So for example, there is a fusion over here, but it's very difficult. Uh, Non-specific staining, you see the nucleus are quite good, but you can see the dots here and there. Um, so it can identify such type of problems. Clumped cells, smearing is poor or the slide is not made accurate. So it results in clumped cells. These are the quality issues, sparse cells. So sparse cells is not essentially an, uh, an issue, but it's an issue because it takes more time and it increases the turnaround time. So um, because you have to capture more cells and even the scanners take more time. Uh, out of focus cells and signals, uh, you, so once they're out of focus, then it's a problem. 
a vibration effect, minor vibrations affect the microscope and we can identify those and, and those are filtered out. Uh, faint signals, empty frames. Uh, so these are some these are some of the examples. So this system is under validation. We have developed it. Um, finally, let me move on towards uh, some of the lessons learned while you're executing on the ground some of the, these issues. So there's a lot of domain knowledge um, gap between the two sides, and it takes a lot of time to cover that and come at the same point. Um, AI models has strict limitations due to which we came up with data quality checks for every project that we do. So, so this is very, very important to, to make sure that we need to understand that AI models fail as, as soon as you change some of the conditions. Uh, in some of the areas, it's it might not be relevant. For example, where you have, for example, in radiology, there is a lot of you know standardization in terms of data, but there are areas where it is not. So in those cases, there are issues. Uh, resistance to adoption, um, you know, so whenever there is a change in the workflow of any even technician at the technician level, there is a lot of resistance. So all the solutions that we build are, you know, keeping in view the, the, the workflows. Um, another important point that we have observed while we interact with the, uh, the community is the AI is seen as a replacement rather than assistance and augmentation. This is a misconception. Uh, there's a big, uh, another important point is there's a big uh, gap between proof of concept and commercial grade. So whenever you give a proof of concept, so there's a, sense of urgency that where is the commercial grade thing, whereas, you know, 80% of the work has to be done. Explainability and observability. This is one of the things that we are working on. So for example, if there's, there's a certain sort of interpretation that is generated, there should be an explanation. Uh, medical community does not uh, and should not accept like binary decisions. So, so there's a subtle difference between explainability and observability. By explainability, we mean, okay, the decision that ha has been taken has to be explained in a way that the clinician or the physician is used to. So he can relate, okay, these are the reasons and this is why this interpretation is this. Observab observability pushes uh, transparency on another level where it allows uh, the user or the physician to actually observe inside of the AI that why different decisions were taken. So it, it's a next you know, layer of uh, transparency. Um, and data. Last point is data. Uh, there are a lot of real world variations and uh, system keep, you know, variation, unknown variations due to which we have to continuously monitor uh, the AI. Uh, labeled and good data is a bottleneck uh, and biasness. Um, these are some of the future direction and projects that we are doing. Uh, some of them are in line. Uh, cell analysis, uh, automated flow gating, karyotyping and uh, triage. So any cycle coming in, it will be automatically, there will be parsing of CBC report, uh, the clinical notes, and it will automatically look under the microscope. And then based on the microscope and the, the clinical notes and the CBC reports, it can triage or recommend it's, uh, you know, that what tests need to be further ordered uh, based on the history and the data from the other patients that we have. So, so these are certain projects that we are doing. With that, I think I have, uh, yes. So thank you very much. I think I've taken my 45 minutes and I'll. Thank you so much, Dr. Hassan. Uh, that was uh, very, very useful and in-depth. Um, I, um, you know, I find these uh, talks very useful for my own learning. Uh, and for example, I've often wondered about this uh, level uh, three, level four, level five. Uh, I have a Tesla, I drive a Tesla. So we often debate between this is level three uh, automation and then uh, GM comes out and say, oh, we have level five already and this and that, you know, the, the Google's program uh, uh, and so on and so forth. But anyways, uh, I think before I go on to some questions that, that I have thought and I see some questions coming up, uh, let me address one important question that uh, that somebody asked and is probably in the mind of many many people who are listening to to these talks the question you know is that um, uh, how does these kind of technologies or ai in healthcare translate to patient care now, how is it useful to physicians how is it useful for for patient care i think um, there are many ways to think about it but if you 
look at that level four and level five that uh, Dr. Hassan mentioned. So level four still needs human confirmation, which means that there is not even a debate that the, com the computer program is doing a better job than a human at level four. At level five, when there's full automation, now you can start comparing, okay, whose performance is better, uh, a fully automated program or, or the human. So forget the level five for now, focus on level four. So if level four still needs human supervision, then, then what's the use, what's the value? And I think there are many values to it. So for example, uh, one important value is that any repetitive task, human have poor attention span. We become fatigued, we get tired, we get bored. We may not have slept last night. We may, may be emotionally stressed out because of a fight we had. But that's one of the things that, that a software does is that it takes all that variability out. It takes out all of that emotionality and stress and, and boredom of a task. So repetitive tasks, actually you want these kind of scut works to be done by someone else, right? So you want those kind of labeling or, or separating or, or figure, figuring out pattern talks. You want your life to be easy. You want a servant. You, know, you want someone to just take all that off of your hand so that you can focus more on higher intellectual tasks or higher intelligent tasks, more decision-making. Um, it, it's also, you feel as a second check, you know, when two people are working together, they often say, you know, I'm not sure about this, what do you think? So that's what an AI can do for you, that it can mark something. So you may be thinking, oh, it looks okay, but then if AI mark, there may be something there. You may, it gives you an idea, okay, let me think it again. And, and let me make sure that I'm not missing something. So it's kind of a second look uh, kind of a feeling that you can do. But, uh, you know, it's, it's also, you know, as I said, it's a large data processing. So, if, you know, you will get tired if you have to review uh, papers from 100 students. So it was easy for me if, you know, if AI have already solved it and say, okay, just, you know, look at these things and, and decide on your final marks. So I want large data processing and large information to be done by someone else. And a computer is the best person to do it so that it's not, not your job uh, to worry about. Uh, I think it basically we should think about it as, as a freedom with reduced hours of work. It, it's very interesting. I was looking at this uh, uh, study, which showed that uh, over the last 30 years, human productivity have gone up four times. So, uh, for, so eight hours job used to produce a fourth of what an eight hour job produced right now. But we have not cut down the hours. We still have to work eight hours although we're producing more and more and more and more. And so it's the same thing that as a physician, we're expected to see a lot more patient. We're seeing three to four times more patient than a physician used to see 30 years ago. But, you know, we still have to work eight hours. You know, your duty is from, you know, nine to five or from eight to eight or whatever. The so shift size have not come down and they just want us to work more and work more. So the one way to get rid of this uh, hour limitation or burden of work is by, delegating these work to these kind of AI models who take on these kind of jobs and tasks and free up your time and uh, give you a second look, give you a second confidence. Okay, I haven't missed anything. Somebody has, has been looking at over the shoulder for you. It gives you a uh, check when you, there is fatigue, when there's boredom. It helps you process large amount of data and, and declutters your work, you know, reduces the scut work for you. So I think it's extremely useful tools uh, for us to, to develop for ourselves and make our life easier and make our life more convenient. Um, let me, before I ask um, any more uh, questions, I have a few, Dr. Hassan. Let me see if uh, any of my panelists have any comments to add on why AI in healthcare uh, you know, is so valuable for us to think about. Ji, sir, Professor. Ji, Assalamu alaikum. First of all, amazing talk, and I'm looking forward to Dr. Hassan's participation in our AI uh, symposium in, on 21st of December in uh, Hindi. Uh, I think the uh, AI, uh, as you said, uh, Dr. Danish and Dr. Hassan said that it really increases the output, the accuracy, and uh, it can work 24 hours a day. And therefore, uh, you know, productivity is, uh, is, uh, is markedly increased uh, as long as the, the model is, is correct. The template has to be uh, very accurate. And... Uh, I, I think that basic understanding of what Dr. Hassan has uh, taught us today is important for people to get interested and actually reduce the fear, the, uh, the phobia of AI that many of the you know, physicians, especially the older physicians like me, might have. So uh, I'm going to let others uh, comment uh, on this now. Thank you. Okay. Hey, I um, have a question. 
with uh, uh, Dr. Sajid. Uh, that uh, do you, Sajid? Do you know any other um, people working in hematology AI um, in Pakistan? So, Dr. Shahid, uh, mm, yes. Yeah, so, I, I think there is some research work, but not at a commercial grade. So, I know some people are working on uh, in terms of research, but they are more focused on the tissue uh, samples, um, but not they are not working on the peripheral blood or bone marrow. Uh, how about um, thalassemia or these kind of work or sickle cell anemia or any of the uh, you know, diseases or hematology? Uh, no, not really. Not at a commercial scale. You know, on research, yes, they have some collaborations where they are working to publish papers and, and those things. Uh, in NUST, we do have some other members who are working, uh, but not uh, in a way that it's a commercial grade or something. So l let me uh, start with some questions. Uh, 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 Dr. Hassan, um, you, you know, it's interesting. Uh, one thing that you pointed out was as a side project, you also looked at improving the quality of the stained tissue. And that has been something that's on the back of my mind for the last few weeks that there are these projects coming out, commercial projects, which are looking at uh, image processing for enhancement and clarity. So I was looking at uh, like driving in a fog, driving when there is, you know, in Pakistan, it's not fog. Hoti hai. Or driving mm -hmm. clarity ho hai. but they're looking mm -hmm. at these AI based analysis ke wo they can they can defog the picture and, and make mm -hmm. it more clear visual for you drone pictures ke liye, jab aap drone bhejte hai, aur clouds aage hai, cloud cover aage hai, aapko picture nahi mil rahi, to usko remove karne ke liye. and uh, staining mein aapne dikha hai ke you can enhance the clarity of picture I was uh, uh, introduced to a paper by Dr. Babar which looked at even AI based staining so if you have mm -hmm. digital pictures not the actual tissue now you cannot stain it because you know chemical staining requires a tissue. But what if you only have the digital slides? Can you train an AI to digitally stain it, looking at those patterns that you know that chemicals bind to? Uh, and then lastly, one thought I had today, looking at you about imaging clarity in the radiology. A lot of time we get so many artifacts of poor image quality on a CT scan or an MRI or a chest X-ray or, or other X-rays. Uh, is there a, a possibility of AI enhancing those kind of pictures. Years ago, I was looking at this uh, work that came out from Harvard. They were doing enhancement of videos. So they had these babies sleeping and you always get worried, is baby breathing or not, right? There's a you know, it's two week old, four week old. So they had this uh, image enhancement where you could actually see babies breathing enhanced by this video processor uh, live, uh, you know, real time. So you could actually tell that baby is breathing from like, you know, from, from distance. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, okay. and things like that. So, and we try to do use that for tremors. Sometimes we have these very subtle tremors that, which are very hard to visualize or see. And we were going to see if we can use those image enhancement, video enhancement to see if we can see the tremors better. I did a project on that. I wrote a paper on orthostatic tremor. So what's your thought on, on these kind of scope in, in healthcare? So definitely it is doable. So as you gave two examples, one is radiology. Definitely radiology is not, I would say, you know, so much in problem in terms of the quality, uh, but since we have a lot of uh, standardization over there, but it can be done provided what exp the experiments that we have done uh, till now. So this is one thing, but of course it, it has to be followed by a very intensive, uh, you know, uh, study in terms of its quality that the credibility is there. There's nothing that has changed so that the diagnosis is not affected. Uh, this is one thing uh, about the the other thing that you mentioned, especially observability of the uh, breathing patterns. Yes, uh, there are algorithms that people have developed to observe the micro motions. Uh, and that is what is used uh, uh, to observe very subtle motions, um, like you said, for uh, uh, for the for the children and those things. So, so there's a lot of things that are going on, but uh, the only caution that I would do is that it has to be followed by a very, very rigorous, uh, I would say, uh, study. And that takes a you know major portion. And that is where you start to understand the edge cases that, oh, we need to do this and that. And, 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 and that is the real challenge. And that is where we need to set the framework right at the beginning of, beginning of any project. So. Uh, Dr. Farasat, please go ahead. 
Thank you, Lee. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Hassan. Very nice and brilliant work. Uh, just wanted to comment on this, this staining, uh, what that you mentioned, the problem with the staining, right? So th and this is a very well-known problem from, I mean, affecting the AI and uh, even in the developed countries who are running these projects. Um, we work quite extensively with the staining, my students, PhD students, with the muscle tissues and, you know, with that uh, in stem cells and in the bone and, and uh, do you think that it's possible that if you, when you have developed a software, AI-based software, for example, your company or whatever, then you also write in, in instructions that these reagents for the staining of the tissue or the cells, these, uh, these are the appro uh, approved companies where one sh the lab should buy, uh, should buy, right? Because then uh, it's said like, uh, it basically at least it uh, addresses the issue of the colors differences in the staining in the tissue. Because if, if, if someone, if another lab buys from Sigma and the third lab buys from mm. uh, Thermo Fisher and the, another lab buys from very, uh, you know, cheap uh, uh, supplier. So that will definitely affect the, you know, the staining colors. And so do you have any comment on this? Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Prasad. Yes, that's a very valid point. And we are sort of in standardization phase, as you said. Um, both in terms of what we are letting into the system at the data quality point. And of course, um, I think this would add further value, but initially we do not want to constrain maybe to, um, to a cert certain companies to make sure that we have uh, until it performs well and there's a data quality that is conformed, then we will let in. Otherwise, uh, we will reject it outrightly, irrespective of the, um, you know, stain. But of course, if there is a requirement of certain red flags are there, we can, you know, rule them that these are not, you know, you being used or these cannot be used. Uh, but yes, thank you. That's a very valid well actually point. About uh, data sets. Uh, so let me just lump two, three questions together. Uh, one uh, part of the question is about these uh, commercially available standardized data sets that people buy to train their algorithms on, you know, what's the value of starting that way? That does it even translate to an actual real life work later on when you're working in an institution? The second question related to that will be that, um, uh, you know, what's the challenge of training on data set from a particular institute and they have their certain machines they're working on and then trying to transpose that work to another institute or or generalize it to nationally or multiple different companies. Uh, you know, uh, Professor Sarris was, for example, telling me just, just for one simple thing like mammogram, there's like four or five different machines out there and each one have their own settings and, you know, differences in their data. And then the third thing that I want to link to that question is that if there was a, a, an effort to create a national data bank, a biobank repository at NIH, for example, and with all this overhaul going on with the National Institute of Health, uh, you know, what kind of parameters or what kind of data is the most useful or, or what kind of uh, things you would suggest or recommend that, that should be, uh, that, that we should push to prioritize to develop a central national biobank or data repository? So uh, comment on the first point is the commercial data sets. Um, so generally, if we talk about the um, AI domain, uh, whenever we have, we talk about videos or images, um, then it becomes a big problem to scale and translate because there are variations. Um, but if we talk about the other forms of data that is text or structured data, um, so, so, so there are not too much variations, um, then those can be scaled to some extent, but with a caution that we don't have, uh, with a caution that we do have the representative data. For example, we cannot uh, push one model that is trained on one region or population to any other region. So genetics is a clear example of that. So it depends from application to application, but in general, if you are technically talking, so image or, or the vision, vision part would be the most complex to scale. Others part might go. And, and this is where, you know, having multiple, uh, so going to your second question, uh, having multiple type of uh, you know data gathering devices or instruments, this is where it becomes a challenge. If you uh, you know there are different type of stains than optics, um, so this creates a problem. So practically, it's not possible. Uh, we understand the limitations that AI has, 
And that is why before doing any type of AI, we put the framework at that place and learn on the live environment in a shadow mode, rather than you know doing the whole process and then going there and failing. Um, so this has you know taught us because you know your accuracy is also depending on the process that they are following. And so, so it's a you know lesson learned the hard way. But we so so there's no point in I would say scaling is a big issue provided the limitations of AI at this point. Um, so the last point, uh, national data bank. Um, I think there should be uh, some policy matters that needs to be pushed out. That first of all, there should be sharing of data in some some sort of anonymized way where patient information is uh, you know. Uh, so from a privacy perspective, second is some sort of standardization that, for example, all the labs, institutes and hospitals, like in developed world, there are some standards, but in the other parts of the world, especially the developing countries like our, uh, there is no standards or data sharing protocols. And this is really hampering the, uh, uh, you know, the accessibility for the practitioners, uh, AI practitioners, and of course, there's no value addition. So I think th there needs to be some policy formulated to man, you know, sort of bind them that they need, because this is something public, especially the public uh, uh, institutes and labs. Uh, so, so this would be a great uh, push. And then I think people can add a lot of value. So, so Dr. Asin, it sounds like listening to you that uh, if there is a software train on AI in, uh, in America, North America, you cannot just buy it and start using it in Pakistan. It's not going to work. If you train on North American Caucasian population, you know, different head circumference, different head size shape, and you cannot take a CT imaging for acute stroke AI program and then say, okay, we're going to implement it in Pakistan. So if we don't create our own solutions, Pakistan will be left behind. But these are now so population specific solutions that if we don't build it in a house, we will we'll be just left behind. We will not be able to just buy and and start using it. Correct. That is 100% correct. For most of the cases, there are only some exceptions where I think this can be done. Uh, otherwise, um, it's the limitation of the technology. So, and Professor Sarwat, maybe you can write an opinion article on uh, need for a national data sharing agreement or policy framework or right. structure for Dr. Well, Hassan and all of us. Hey, I was just going to say that actually the um, Jo apne farmaya hai, that is not, uh, not exactly, exactly correct, although generally it's correct. There are certain programs that are being provided with a package of CT scan and MRI that have some uh, borderline or basic uh, AI capabilities of detecting and diagnosing. And uh, because it is, it is, it is pixel uh, dependent rather than the overall uh, macro appearance of the uh, uh, of the picture so i think some of it is still applicable you know on uh, because ct scan uh, an image is uh, has similar pixels irrespective of the color of the skin of course and so uh, some of it is still applicable but not uh, uh, not all of it so um, that is my comment in the paper on uh data sharing agreements and policy framework? Absolutely. Yeah, let's do it together. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let's do it. Wonderful. So we're running over time, but any panelists have any comments or uh, any other uh, burning questions they should address before we close for today? All right, we're looking forward to all of you, especially Dr. Hassan, for you, your presence on the AI in Healthcare Symposia on December 21st in RMU, and then the main merit conference on healthcare innovation and startups on 22nd, December 22nd at RMU. Uh, and all of you guys are invited. Please join us over there. There will be Zoom link to watch, but we'd love to have you in person so we can get to meet, meet each other face to face. Uh, you know, too many, too long of a lockdown since pandemic. So we'll, we need to physically meet. Uh, and thank you for joining today. Thank you, everyone. Everybody have a nice day. Thank, thank you. you very much. Allah. Allah. Allah.